I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, did Michael Peterson kill his wife? And if not, who else could it be? We get to the bottom of the staircase. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, with my lovely co-host, Alice. Hey, Brett. How are you doing today? Doing well. Doing well. Happy to be back with you again today to talk about the Michael Peterson case. I'm so excited. Maybe because I've been binge-watching The Staircase on Netflix, but this is just a fascinating case factually and from like the trial perspective so i'm so excited for us to get to talk about this now alice had not seen the staircase so i forced her to watch it basically all in a few days so she's very well steeped in that documentary biased though it may be we'll have to see how that affects alice's view of this case and we're going to be talking about this one for a while this is definitely going to be a multi-parter We're going to use this case to talk about a lot of different legal topics, evidentiary rules, the role of the jury, how prosecutors and defense attorneys approach opening and closing argument. I mean, there is so much you can dive into in this case beyond the facts. And I know most of you have probably heard this story before and are familiar with this case. So I hope that we can bring something different with that. That doesn't mean all of you know this case. And that's one reason that we started today's show with the 911 call. I wanted folks who don't know this case to hear that call without any preconceived notions and really sort of evaluate that from, you know, a position of a sort of tabula rasa, right? Without us biasing you in any way. And I think it was interesting, Allison, we'll get to this Uh, once we get to the trial, that the defense essentially started with that 911 call and ended with that 911 call. And when we get sort of to that, I'll be interested to know what you think about that and whether you think that was a good idea or a bad idea. Can Can I just say one thing about how excited I am about this case? So I love, I think I'm not alone. I love Hamilton the Musical. And I actually put on hold watching Hamilton, the musical stream on Disney Plus to watch all of the episodes of The Staircase. (laughs) I know that might not mean anything to you, Brett, but I think it will mean a lot to a lot of people out there. And they'll understand just how great this case is. These are the sacrifices that Alice makes for the audience and the podcast. Now, I love Hamilton, so I don't know why you're throwing shade my way. Like, I don't like <laughs> Hamilton. I do I like I didn't say Hamilton. you didn't like it. It was just a, it was, uh, it was like tearing myself away uh, from a true love. So I'm just saying this, this is another true love. Hamilton's only like three hours long. I don't know why you couldn't just watch it in one sitting. <laughs> okay. I know people say we talk too much about our kids, but do you try to watch a three hour movie with two kids? It's impossible. Well, yeah, you put them to bed. This is like a, you know, <laughs> eight fifteen to 1130 thing or something. Uh, I don't know. If only. I know you probably if don't only. have the energy to stay up. <laughs> if anyway, only. 
So all these these people who complain about us babbling too long at the beginning, you're not going to like any of that, but that's fine because I don't care. It's our <laughs> podcast. So anyway, turning to the case. So we're going to take you all the way back to 2001. And it's the early morning hours of December 9th. And there's a desperate 911 call, the call that you just heard that's made to the Durham police. A woman has fallen down the stairs and is seriously injured. Her desperate husband wants someone, anyone, to come to help her, to save her life. He's so flustered, so frustrated with the 911 operator that he actually ends up hanging up on the operator. But then as time is passing and help is still not arriving, he actually calls back a few minutes later, even more desperate. His wife had been breathing before, but now she's not breathing anymore. That man is Michael Peterson, and his wife is Kathleen Peterson, and she is at the bottom of the back stairway in their home. There's blood everywhere, and by the time the paramedics arrive, it is obvious to everyone that she is dead, and so begins the saga of the staircase. So we come to the night of her death. Kathleen and Michael were celebrating. See, Michael was an author, and he had found success at one point. Um, in fact, he had received an $800,000 advance for one of his books, and that was the money that paid for the mansion that they lived in. But his writing career had kind of stalled a little bit. Um, books weren't selling as much as we all understand. But now that same book had been optioned, and the expectation was that his once promising writing career can be revived. And honestly, it was about time, because although Kathleen made a six-figure salary as a successful executive at Nortel, money was tight. The economy was contracting after 9-11, and so the family was under constant economic strain. And Alice, I don't know if you know anything about Nortel, but you know it, it, the story of Nortel is really the story of the late 90s bubble popping. I mean, this was a company that was exploding that was going to take over the world of telecommunications. And at one point, Kathleen, through the stock options that she had in Nortel, I mean, she's looking at millions of dollars worth of stock. But by this point, with 9-11 having, having happened and the dot-com bubble having burst, those millions of dollars worth of stock options had fallen to like $50,000. So oh, they're goodness. definitely... They are definitely having some financial problems, but hey, you know, this, this option for the movie, I mean, that could be huge, right? I mean, the people of the country, they're looking for positive stories and Michael is a war hero and he's written this book about Vietnam. And then there's another book called like Charlie Two Shoes or something like that, or Charlie One Shoe, I don't even know, um, <laughs> that's about World War II. And he's thinking, hey, if I can make a movie and like Ben Affleck's going to star in this movie, all of a sudden everybody's going to be buying my books and I'll be selling new books and all of these money troubles will fade away. So what a great night or so it started out as. And uh, Michael and Kathleen were celebrating. This was great for the family. Finally, you know, things were starting to turn for them. And so to celebrate, they watched a movie, American Sweethearts. And that's what everyone thought they were, the perfect couple. Michael Peterson was a graduate from Duke University. And after spending some time working for a defense contractor, he was so moved by what he saw that he joined the Marines and earned a silver and bronze star in Vietnam. But despite this heroism, a cloud would eventually descend over that service in Vietnam when Michael claimed to have earned purple hearts for combat injuries that he'd never had. He'd actually only been injured in a jeep accident while in the military, and he may or may not have received a medal for that, but he was not injured in combat. And I think it's worth stopping here and just thinking about that for a second, because it's really interesting, Michael's service in Vietnam. On the one hand, it's so laudable. I mean, he's working for this defense contractor right out of college. He's researching the war. And in learning about this, he decides, I can't stand on the sidelines. I have to be a part of this. And so he joins the Marines at a time when nobody wanted to go to Vietnam. And most people are being drafted to go to Vietnam. And he joins of his own accord. 
and he's involved in a battle while he's in Vietnam. And what exactly happened in that battle is pretty murky. It's kind of controversial. There are soldiers who were serving under Michael who said that when his outpost was attacked in the middle of the night by the Viet Cong, that he had led them um, bravely and competently, and they'd been able to withstand the attack. And his radio operator, I believe it was, was shot uh, during this attack and actually died in Michael's arms. It's a, it's a scene that he actually writes about in one of his books. And whatever happened or didn't happen at that battle, he did eventually win a bronze star and a silver star for his service in Vietnam. But it's as if that just wasn't enough for Michael. He didn't want to just be brave. He wanted to be injured. He wanted to be able to point to some sort of concrete loss he had suffered. So he has, he, he claims that he was shot once and that he was injured by a landmine another time. And that resulted in these two purple hearts. And it turns out, and, and he tells this story for years. And it turns out much later that in reality, it was a Jeep accident where he was injured. And it's not even clear whether he actually got a purple heart for that or not. I think even if you're injured in an accident, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong about this, I never served in the military, so I'm not sure. But I think if you are still in service and injured in an accident, you can receive a Purple Heart. But he certainly wasn't injured in combat. You know, that cloud sort of fell over Michael, and it would follow him for the rest of his life. And it would make people doubt him on issues that were important. And that was about to become very important. Absolutely. You see, Mike had married his first wife, Patricia, and they uh, lived in Germany. They had two sons, Todd and Clayton. And later on, they'd adopt two more children, Margaret and Martha, when their friend Liz Ratliff tragically died from a brain disorder when Margaret and Martha were, I think, one and two. So they took in these pair of sisters at a very young age when they already had two boys. Subsequently, Mike and Pat Patricia would divorce amicably. Uh, and later on, Mike would marry Kathleen Hunt Atwater of Durham, North Carolina. Kathleen and Mike moved into 1810 Cedar Street, a $1.7 million mansion with a narrow back staircase. And you know, it's funny because we talked about these money troubles and they're going to come up again and again and again as we talk about this case. And I think it's hard for some people out there to understand how if you're making, you know, $150,000 a year, how can you have money troubles? You know, I think the average median income in this country is still between forty and fifty thousand dollars. So we're talking three times that. But what we know from looking at their finances, they had a one point seven million dollar house. They had used the eight hundred thousand dollar advance to help buy that house, but it certainly didn't pay it off. And they had taken out a couple mortgages on it. So they had a lot of debt. And they were living like they were making a lot of money. And so I have read some accounts that they had around $100,000 more going out every year than they had coming in. And they were keeping their heads above water basically by taking out loans on credit cards and sort of moving money around as best they could. But with Kathleen's job in a real precarious situation, it wasn't just that her stock options had fallen so precipitously. It was also that her job was on the chopping block. So you can imagine the stress that they were under. And between them, they had five children because Mike came in with, you know, her, his two biological sons and two adopted daughters who were for all intents and purposes, his, his daughters. Um, and uh, Kathleen had a daughter as well. So they had five children living with them. Right. And I think, Three of those kids were in college, so you can imagine the cost associated with that. I think all the girls were in college. Caitlin was in an Ivy League school, so that's not cheap. And then Todd and Clayton, I think they were out of college, but they hadn't really got their feet under them yet, and so their parents were really helping them, and I think even paying their credit card bills. So it was a difficult situation, and it was a situation where money was tight. But like Alice said earlier, this was a night of celebration. This was a night 
where maybe those problems were going to be behind them. And according to Michael, on the night of December 9, 2001, they were celebrating. They opened a couple bottles of wine. They went to the pool after they finished their movie to enjoy a beautiful night, drink those bottles of wine. And at some point, Mike decides he's going to smoke a cigar under the stars. Now, Kathleen, she can't hang out with him while he's doing this. She's got work the next morning. She has a meeting. She's expecting an email. And so at some point, she goes back inside the house to work on her computer. Just as an aside, you know, I've smoked the occasional cigar and often been in situations very much like this where, you know, hanging out outside and at some point the wife decides I've had enough, I'm going inside, but I'm smoking a cigar. And those of you who smoke cigars know it takes forever to smoke a cigar. And once you light it, you don't want to put it out because you can never relight it. So, (laughs) (laughs) so I can totally imagine Michael staying behind and deciding to smoke the rest of that cigar. And that taking, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to do. And according to Michael, that's exactly what happens. And around 45 minutes later, he makes his way up to the house. And that's when he finds Kathleen at the bottom of the stairs. And before we move on from there, you know, I my first thought when I was just reading the facts was, okay, from the pool to the house, how far could that be? But remember, this is quite the extravagant mansion. And the pool is kind of this oasis, you know, uh, at the end of this long path from the house. So it's actually quite secluded from the house. Um, So uh, I note that because of what we're going to describe next. I know some of you guys, you know, Islington, England is currently our highest... uh, downloading city huge shout out to you guys thank you yeah shout out to islington my understanding is islington is part of london it's sort of you know london i don't know why this is it's kind of interesting it seems like london is made up of all these other little cities so for a long time i didn't realize for instance that like half the soccer teams in the premier league are really just playing in london in like different parts of london uh (laughs) so but in any event I'm sure in London, $1.7 million probably doesn't go very far. If you're listening to us in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago, you might be thinking the same thing. In Durham, North Carolina, when you spend $1.7 million on a house, you are getting yourself a house. And it is a huge It is baller. It's like a little bit of a castle. It really is. For those of us in London. (laughs) (laughs) This pool might as well be, you know... In another neighborhood or something, it's it's so far away. Uh, and it's one point in the documentary, just to sort of talk about how far away it was, they actually do an experiment to try and figure out whether you could hear anything going on in the house at the pool. And the answer is no, you cannot. So that should give you an idea of just how far away it is. Yeah, they do screaming tests where they're seeing if you're down at the pool and you can hear anyone screaming from inside the house and like absolutely nothing. That's not the type of house I live in. So if you scream anywhere in my house, I can hear it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um. (laughs) I don't want people to get the wrong idea about me. (laughs) I don't live in this $1.7 million house. I can ever imagine, no matter how much... uh, Hello Fresh or Third Love money flows into this podcast. Never going to own a one point seven million dollar house. I think I can say that with with pretty much certainty. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. We're just waiting on those those phone calls. Hello Fresh. <laughs> so, one question. Later on, the cops show up. Yeah, you know, obviously, there's a lady lying dead at the bottom of a staircase covered in blood. There's blood everywhere. Um, we're going to put some photos up on the website. They're certainly it's, not for it's the shocking. It is shocking yeah. the amount of blood. I've seen a lot it's of like crime scene photos, movie. right? But it's just a, a lot of blood. It's a lot of blood. And that fact that it's a lot of blood is going to come back over and over and over in this story. But when Mike's asked about it, what do you think happened? He has a theory. It's essentially that between the alcohol, the wine they were drinking, the flip-flops that she was wearing, 
at some point, she's going up this very narrow staircase. I mean, it's kind of interesting. The house has two staircases, which is fairly common for a mansion such as this. It has a staircase in the front, sort of the grand staircase, you can imagine. You know, like the gone with the wind, huge, you know, spiraling staircase going up to the second floor. And then in the back near the kitchen, there's the servant's staircase. And this was the staircase that the servants would use to sort of move up and down, make food, whatever. Well, that was the staircase they actually mostly used. Um, Which makes so, sense because the grand staircase is really only to the grand entryway, but the most of the life of the house is in the back where the kitchen and the living room are. Exactly. You know, and it is the typical sort of narrow back staircase that you imagine. It has sort of a couple steps leading up to a small landing and then a 90 degree turn and then steps all the way up to the top. And they're narrow steps and you can imagine that they're, you know, not the 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 easiest stairs to climb, particularly when you've been drinking. And so he imagines she was walking up those stairs and at some point she slipped and fell and hit her head. And, you know, that's essentially the story he tells when he talks to the 911 operator. And you guys heard that call earlier and in sort of an interesting part of that. And I just, uh, we can talk about that 911 call at some point, but when the, when the operator's asking him how many stairs she fell down and he's like, I don't know, 20, 30, whatever. Uh, basically, at some point, she's walking up the stairs, she slips, and she falls. And an interesting thing about that is the first medical examiner who comes on the scene, he actually agrees. He looks at the scene, he looks at the blood, and he agrees that everything he is seeing is consistent with a fall down the stairs and it's pretty obvious why he thinks that. It's clear that Kathleen has hit her head. And what everyone knows is that head injuries bleed really badly. So the fact that there's so much blood doesn't necessarily mean there's been a murder. It very well could have been an accident. It very well could have been her falling down the stairs. And with no obvious evidence of murder, his initial thought is, okay, that makes sense to me. She fell down the stairs, but the police aren't so sure. But neither are the detectives who soon show up to take a look at this scene. And what they see is a bloodbath, one that they just can't believe is consistent with a tumble down the stairs. Homicide detectives uh, are there by now, but they're seeing something that isn't consistent to them with an accident, even though that first medical examiner on the scene, the first guy to really take a look at this, thought, yeah, I think it could be a fall. Homicide detectives thought differently. Have you seen have you seen a serious head injuries before? Have you seen blood spew from a head? And I, I only say that because <laughs> I, have not, I, I Dawn, do have a story. To hear your story on this. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a story on this. This is going somewhere. Um so Go look at these pictures because I assure you it will shock you. We can keep telling you it's a bloodbath, but until you see the pictures, it really is shocking to see how much blood there is. And my first thought is, no way, no how, you can fall down the stairs and cause this much blood. But then I was suddenly remembering a story. Uh, this is going to make me sound like a terrible person, but for the purposes of uh, properly understanding the facts in this case, I'm going to share it with all of you. So... I was young, maybe four or five, and our family was just about to move um, move states for my dad's job. And I have um, a younger brother, so I think he's maybe like two or three at this point, so not great walking, right? He's a toddler. And I actually remember this vividly in my head. I'm not a very nice sister, clearly, from the story you're going to be able to tell. Um, but I think we were both running for the kitchen. I think maybe we were going to compete for a snack. I don't remember what it was, but he was getting ahead of me or he bumped me. I don't remember which one, but I shoved him like a good big sister and his head went straight into the corner of just a normal household wall. Like it's not particularly sharp. You can imagine go to the corner of any of your walls. I'm looking at one right now in my closet. I'm still in my closet. Um, and his head hit it. Um, he basically kind of tripped forward, hit his head, didn't even seem that bad. And there was one basically gash in the front of his forehead and blood spewed. I mean, the best I can tell you what it looked like was Monty Python when the knight gets all his limbs cut off. <laughs> and there's like clearly, you know, someone's like push, pulsating fake blood and it's like spewing out. And he's like, it's just a flesh wound. 
that's what it looked like. And that was just one gash on my little brother, you know, two or three year old's head. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, I've, I've killed my brother. Like, I remember just thinking like the world was over. Um, so I only say that cause I had never, I've yet since then never seen a head wound. And, um, that is my one experience and boy, was it a lot of blood. I'm not a terrible sister. I hope, I hope you know this. And I think my little brother's listening and I love him very much. <laughs> But thank you for that yeah. experience, little brother. <laughs> now people can know how much blood comes from a head. He knew how valuable that experience would be <laughs> many years later. <laughs> it was all worth it, little brother. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I think... So this case is very controversial, obviously. Um, and I think one of the distinctions between people who think Michael Peterson did it and think Michael Peterson didn't do it are people who've had experience with head wounds like that because a lot of people who think he did it, who think he murdered Kathleen, put a lot of stock in the idea that all that blood has to be the result of some sort of homicidal attack. Uh, and that's actually what the homicide detectives decide is exactly that. I mean, they look at this scene and they are immediately thinking, murder now they are homicide detectives so they're kind of you know, thinking murder kinda, all the time <laughs> yeah you kind of want them to assume murder in the very beginning and then kind of rule it out because you don't want a murder to get away just because nobody ever thought this might be a murder but when they see that blood it's more than just sort of a hypothetical consideration they're thinking <laughs> i don't know about this guys and there were some other things that made them think this doesn't look like an accident number one they totally did not buy michael's story that he had been hanging out by the pool michael was wearing shorts and a t-shirt and it was 55 degrees outside that night and you know there were just people who thought you don't hang out outside for over an hour in shorts and a t-shirt when it's 55 degrees now i know lots of people who do exactly that uh, especially, I don't know what it is about old men. They must like have no blood flow whatsoever, but they do that all the time. It seems like, so I actually don't think that's that crazy, but I can understand why it's a little bit of a red flag. And it wasn't just that. And it wasn't just that there was a ton of blood. A lot of that blood was congealed and it was dried. And that suggested to them that Kathleen had been there for a lot longer than Michael Peterson was saying, maybe even for a couple of hours before he had called 911. And there were parts of the blood on the staircase that looked as though someone had tried to clean it up, uh, especially from the wall near the stairs. It looked like someone had taken a towel or some paper towels and tried to wipe some of this blood up. There were bloodstained towels that were found beneath Kathleen. Now, Michael would later say that he placed those there um, to try and stop the bleeding. But to make matters worse, there was blood spatter between the legs of Michael's shorts that were difficult to explain if he had only found Kathleen and had not, in fact, inflicted some of these wounds. And some of that blood was on the inside of his pants, right? Not just exactly. on the outside. Exactly. Some of that... Right, right. So it looked as though sort of like a splash of blood had come up and gotten both on the outside of his of shorts and inside his shorts, which was difficult for people to understand how that would happen. And perhaps even worse, there appeared to be a bloody footprint on the back of Kathleen's uh, pants that she was wearing, which suggested that someone and that footprint matched the shoes that Michael Peterson had been wearing, had stood over Kathleen and possibly held her down with that foot while they were beating her. And then there's one tiny insignificant little detail. You see, the police found thousands upon thousands of gay porn, male porn images and hookup conversations on Michael's computer. Prosecutors would identify a male prostitute, Brad, who they would put on the stand during the trial. Brad testified that Michael had written that he was happily married, that he, uh, that his wife was just dynamite, but that he had this itch that needed to scratch. And that's where Brad came in. Now, really quick aside, Brad turns into an absolute rock star uh, of a witness on the stand. He is just 
charming, lovable, and hilarious. But he would testify that he offered the full panoply of services to his clients, from companionship to everything under the sun sexually. So the prosecution really seizes on Brad's testimony and the conversations between Brad and Mike. The prosecution's theory was that when Kathleen used the computer that night, she stumbled upon images and messages that were shocking to her. The prosecution knew that Kathleen had left her computer at work, and that meant when she went inside from the pool to do some work, she'd had to have used Michael's computer that night. And she freaked out when she saw these male porn images and conversations with male prostitutes. And so she confronted Michael and told him she wanted a divorce. And that was when Michael, according to the prosecution, beat Kathleen to her death. And what did he beat her with? Well, they couldn't find anything there. But the prosecution theorized that it was probably a blow poke, a poke that you use in a fireplace, um, that the family had received as a gift from Kathleen's sister many years before. And if those were all the facts of this case, that would be enough. It didn't take the prosecution and the police very long to decide that this was a murder. Uh, it didn't take them very long to arrest Michael and indict him with that murder. The autopsy that they conducted when they looked at Kathleen Peterson's head, they found these deep lacerations. Um, and how that many? Suggested and how many, Brett? Seven. And remember, when I pushed my brother uh, into the wall by accident, I love him very much. It was one, just one gash, and it was not a laceration. Right. And they thought, no way. No way. You get seven lacerations on the top of your head, on the very top of your head, by falling down the stairs. But there's something weird about those injuries. They don't fracture the skull. There's no brain damage, no swelling, no hemorrhaging, nothing like that. So the weapon that Michael used, if he did use a weapon, had to be a unique one. It had to be one that could inflict that damage that could cause those lacerations that led to such massive bleeding that Kathleen would eventually die, but one that he could beat her with without breaking the skull, without causing any fractures. And that's how they settled on this blowpoke, which I had never heard of a blowpoke. I think there were probably 10 blowpokes sold before this documentary come out, came out, and now there are probably more people who own blow pokes just because of this but this blow poke is like i mean it's exactly what it sounds like you can blow through it to sort of add oxygen to the fire and then you can use it like a regular fire poker um so it's hollow and because it's hollow they thought this is the kind of weapon you could use to do this and if you've seen the documentary, you know that Michael Peterson's sister-in-law, Candace, becomes sort of a controversial figure. And she really believed that this was what was used. And she sort of pushed this on the prosecution. Like, this was what was used to kill her because they couldn't find it. It was nowhere to be seen. And she gave this gift to her sister. And she was convinced she wouldn't get rid of it. She wouldn't do anything with it. So if it's not there, it's because Michael Peterson used it to kill Kathleen Peterson and then got rid of it. Now, what's interesting is Kathleen, uh, Kathleen's sister somehow really liked blow pokes, apparently, because she didn't only buy a blow poke for Kathleen. She bought one for many family members, and her sister was able to basically find uh, one of these blow poke presents she had given. So the prosecution had essentially what Kathleen's sister said was a replica of what was used to kill Kathleen. This is very bizarre, by the way, everybody, <laughs> um, to have a replica of a probable or theorized weapon to be used in a crime that you're not even clear about. This is so bizarre. <laughs> like they, man, they hang their hat on this blow poke. They open, in fact. Let's just go ahead. Let's just go ahead and talk about that. Like we haven't even, we haven't even got through all the facts yet, but let's just stop and talk about the blow poke because we're here at the blow poke and I think it is really interesting. Look, if you're prosecuted in a murder case, you want a murder weapon. You want to be able to tell the jury, this is how they did it, right? 
I mean, that's a key part of it. Especially, especially when the defense is essentially that there is no murder, that it was an accident. You really need a murder weapon in that kind of situation. And they don't have one. They can't find one. They can't find anything that even resembles a murder weapon. So they key on the thing that's missing. They key on the thing that's not there. They key in it. And, you know, it just so happens that the thing that's not there also has the ability, they think, to cause these kinds of wounds. And so, like Alice said, they lead with this. In their opening statement, they got the blowpoke. And they're saying, Michael Peterson killed his wife. Now, he, they don't say with this blowpoke, because it's obviously not that one. And they don't even say with a blowpoke. But they imply that. They essentially say something like this. It had to be like this, right? But for all intents and purposes, they're telling that jury they used this, or he used this blowpoke. And Alice... That is so weird to me. That is, <laughs> that is just... here, here's the thing. It is so risky. So really quick on openings. Openings are not supposed to be argumentative. Openings are supposed to be a preview of the facts so that you situate the jury um, for the facts that are going to come because you can only introduce facts through witnesses in a trial. And so you don't get to sit there and tell a narrative and story tell the way we're storytelling to you all. The only time you get to story tell is in your opening and your close. And so in your opening, it's not argumentative because you haven't yet introduced anything into evidence, but you're going to tell the jury what you plan to tell them. And we are all, we are told this from day one of law school. You better deliver whatever you promise to the jury in your opening statement. If you are not sure if you can introduce it as evidence, let's say you know that there's going to be uh, a motion to keep out some important piece of evidence, if you don't know for sure it's going to come in, you better not put it in your opening statement. Now, for them to lead with this weapon that they're not even sure is the weapon and to not even have the actual blowpoke to say something like this is incredibly weak storytelling and also incredibly risky because you're not even saying he killed her with a weapon. You're saying he killed her with this. And so it kind of narrows narrows the defense to we didn't use this <laughs> and this particular blowpoke. Um, and so I, I would not have made that decision as the prosecution if I were them. Yeah. And defense attorneys, Alice is absolutely right. You know, the, the standard is the prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. The defense attorney doesn't have to prove anything. If he can create doubt, great. But he can always just rely on, well, they didn't prove it. That's the way it's supposed to be. But in reality... The best story wins, and the opening should be like a trailer, like a really good trailer to a bad movie. You know, one of those trailers where you see the trailer, and you're like, man, I gotta see that, and then you go out and you watch the movie, and you realize all the best parts were in the trailer. That's what you want, right? You want to hit all your best parts. Almost every Adam Sandler movie. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the best parts A lot of the comedies, the funniest a lot parts of are in the trailer, right? <laughs> But what you definitely don't want to do, and you see this in some trailers, um, like, I'll just take you back to Rogue One. There's a, there's a trailer for Rogue One in which the main character in Rogue One is standing on top of this facility, and this TIE fighter rises up in front of them, and that's like a big scene in the trailer. That scene never appears in the movie. <laughs> so, you don't want that to happen. You don't want to have anything in your trailer, anything in your opening statement that then you never are able to show during the trial. And if you do, you can guarantee that's going to be the defense's entire closing. They told you they were going to show you this. They didn't show it to you. How is that not reasonable doubt? Right? So the opening is so critically important, both to tell the story, to engage the jury and to lay out what you're going to prove and how you're going to prove it. And if you say it, you better follow up on it. And, you know, Brett, you just said that um, the defense never has to prove anything, but in reality, the best story wins. And that's so true in this type of case. This type of case is potentially a murder, right? And while, it, I, I mean, this is what I was thinking the entire time as I was reading about the trial is, 
it's really kind of not fair because in this particular case, I don't actually think reasonable doubt was enough for the jury, even though that should be enough not to convict. And boy, is there reasonable doubt. We'll get there. But because I think what happened was if the defense doesn't have a good story for what happened, and if they, the if the jury doesn't buy that seven lacerations can be caused by flip flops that slip on some back staircases, then they will turn to the better story, which might be the beating, and that's not fair, and that is not what the defense is supposed to have to do. But we've seen the way juries work; they want to they want a full explanation, reasonable doubt. Oftentimes, and especially a grisly crime or potential crime like this, they don't want to just say. I'm not sure. They want to know then what happened. If the prosecution's wrong, then what happened? Right. I mean, the reality of it is the reasonable doubt thing matters a lot in a low-level drug case or a gun case or a robbery case. When you have a dead person, particularly when you have someone who is violently murdered or a child who's murdered, some sort of crime that you know cries out for justice— you need more than reasonable doubt because that jury is looking to give justice to the family. And I think David Rudolph, who was the attorney in this case, fully understood that. And so when he did his opening, he didn't do what a lot of attorneys do. And Alice and I have seen this again and again and again. The opening is basically all about the prosecution and what the prosecution's burden is, and how reasonable doubt is so important, and how they have to prove, they, the prosecution, has to prove everything. And how if the prosecution doesn't prove everything, that means the jury is duty-bound to acquit. Basically, we can we can write you most defenses yes. openings. It's just that you don't even there's no even facts specific to this case. They may not even mention the defendant's name. Right, exactly. It's all about reasonable doubt and how if this prosecution doesn't meet it, then boom. And then at the end, their closing is just, I told you at the beginning, they have to prove everything. They didn't prove everything. All you need is a little bit of doubt. If you got a little bit of doubt, you should quit, right? Well, that's not what David Rudolph does in his opening. David Rudolph paints this, you know, glowing picture, this this storybook picture, this this romantic story that's almost like, you know, it almost has like some Brady Bunch vibes to it on how they had these two families and they blended their families together and they created this this loving household of five different kids from three different people, groups, couples, whatever. Uh, <laughs> and and Rudolph does such a great job. And if you've seen the documentary and listened to his opening, I mean, it really is a powerful opening statement and it humanizes michael um so well i'm actually surprised in at least in my experiences uh that defense do attorneys don't do that more often to humanize the defendant because it's really hard to convict someone if you really like them even though it's not supposed to be but we're all humans, right? If you really right. like someone, you're just you're rooting for them. You're like, they can't be that bad, right? If they're actually good in all these other parts. Yeah, a good lawyer knows the standard, but he knows people better and human psychology and group dynamics. And it's great to have reasonable doubt on your side, but it's better to have the jury on your side. <laughs> it's, it's better to have the jury like you and like your client. Now, look, what Rudolph does has some dangers. It does open the door for the prosecution to really hone in on Michael and the kind of person Michael is. And we're going to talk about this later because it's controversial, but all this stuff about the gay porn and the extramarital relationships with men and say the picture that Rudolph just painted for you, that's the picture Michael Peterson, Michael Peterson wanted to show to the world, but it's not the picture that Kathleen saw. And it's not the picture that she saw that night. That night she saw the real Michael Peter Peterson and this whole storybook facade collapsed and the monster was revealed. And that's when he killed her. Right. And that's what the prosecution does, albeit less eloquently, I might say. Um, <laughs> that's what and, they try you know, and do. You just mentioned something that I think is really powerful, too. We're, we're basically we're giving you all the unwritten rules of 
being a trial attorney here. You are so right that not only um, is it important for the jury to like your client, the jury has to like the attorney. And whether that's the prosecution or the defense, you can get so far for your client if you are lovable, likable, trustworthy to um, the jury. And in this case, I think Rudolph did an incredible, I mean, he seems like a really nice guy. He seems very genuine. And that's what the jury saw as well. Um, and he seems like a very good attorney because he is able to read and connect with jurors so well. And the prosecution, I mean, look, they have an interesting role to play here because in some ways they are the sort of avenging angels. They're the people who are there for Kathleen Peterson. They're the people who have to fight for justice for her. But man, they come off bad. I mean, they are not likable at all. And I get it. You know, we're looking at this through the lens of this documentary, which is obviously very pro Michael Peterson. And I'm sure editing had something to do with this, but... The parts we saw, they don't make me like the prosecution. They seem very bullying, right? And we, we've already— Oh, they are so bullying. Well, we've already said this before. Um, people already view the prosecution as having the upper hand, as being people who want to grab power. And so you don't want to come in looking like the big man with their sharp elbows out to kind of quash the little guy. And that's how they come off. They don't seem—they look like they're there to, to prosecute— and convict Michael Peterson. They don't seem like they're there for justice. And you may be saying to yourself, well, isn't that the same thing? It is and it isn't. You know, if Michael Peterson did this, then yes, of course, justice is him being convicted, but he's still innocent until proven guilty. And you really want the jury to believe that you are there on the side of justice and that you believe Michael Peterson did it because the evidence said he did it. You think he did it for the same reason you want them to think he did it because of the evidence. Just look at the evidence, right? It's not about how you feel personally. It's not about some vendetta. You're not angry or mad. That's not how we decide cases in this country. And they just come off like, like they would do anything to convict this guy and, you know, reasonable doubt and, Alternative evidence be damned. And one, one last thing, and I and I say this because I'm not a person with particularly good poker face. And of course, like you said, the documentary probably edited it so they captured the worst expressions from the prosecution at the most inopportune times. But we, you know, as attorneys, you can't seem surprised in court and you cannot um, make kind of you can't be the peanut gallery right you can't be like hooping and hollering when someone is making a point that you agree with you have to be completely stoic because your job is to argue the facts and the law not to sway the jurors or the judge with your snide remarks or your snide sneering and unfortunately i think the prosecution just doesn't have a good poker face and they do a lot of like the eyebrow raising and the like oh yeah, right, sort of looks. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm perfect at that at all in court. Um, and when you're in court, when you're in front of a jury for five months, you know, it can be really difficult. But that is your job to be professional and to not make it personal or emotional. Right, exactly. And the the lady prosecutor, I think her name is Frida Black, Man, I'd love to play poker against her <laughs> because a poker face she does not have. <laughs> so you already have a semi-famous novelist accused of killing his wife in their $1.7 million mansion uh, by beating her to death and staging a fall down the stairs. And you have the introduction of evidence that... This author, this semi-famous author, who, oh, by the way, had run for mayor before and written scathing articles in the newspaper, critical of the police and the prosecution, both of whom are now accusing him of murder. You might think, wow, that's a crazy case. It can't get any crazier than that. And then it does. <laughs> so, early on in this process, the authorities realize that this is not the first person related to Michael Peterson who's been found dead 
at the bottom of a staircase. And in fact, they claim that not only had Michael killed his wife Kathleen in that manner, he had also killed his friend Liz Ratliff at the bottom of the stairs. The same Liz Ratliff, who was the mother of Margaret and Martha Ratliff, the two daughters who Peterson had raised for 20 years, who sat behind him every day in the courtroom, supporting him without question. It turned out that on November 25th, 1985, when Michael was living in Germany and married to his first wife, Ratliff turned up dead at the bottom of a staircase, just as Kathleen Peterson did 16 years later. Now, up to this point, everyone believed that Ratliff had died of a brain hemorrhage. Witnesses disagreed on whether or not Ratliff's death was the bloody mess that Kathleen's had been, though there were certainly people present when Ratliff was found who said there was plenty of blood in Germany that day. Can we just say, though, that, I mean, I don't want this to be lost. The prosecution is claiming that he had something to do with that. He killed Liz Ratliff. But then remember what he does for the next 16 years. He adopts and raises Liz Ratliff's daughters. And they call him dad. And they are, I mean, they love him like dad. And they sit right behind him at trial this entire time. And seemingly he loves them just as if. They were his own biological daughters. And no one believes that Michael Peterson is innocent more than those two girls. Not his sons, not his lawyer, not his brother, not his ex-wife. In fact, you can tell. In fact, when he says, you know, before the end of trial, uh, before the verdict comes back, he's talking to the cameras and he says, I'm going to be okay, but... You know who's not going to be okay if I get convicted? Margaret and Martha. He doesn't mention right. his other you know, children. He's talking about them. They're the ones that are going to be devastated if he's convicted. This is how strong their bond is. But that bond is tested, at least in the eyes of the prosecution, by what they find when they exhume Ratliff's body in 2003, nearly 20 years after she died. Wait, before before we talk about that, how the heck did the prosecution get her body exhumed? Because, of course, we're going to talk later about whether this evidence will be allowed in trial anyways. But, okay, let's talk about exhuming a body. It's going to be very public. There can be cameras. You're going to be digging up at a cemetery. And, in fact, there are camera crews watching the exhuming of this body. How... I'm asking you, Brett, how, how did the prosecution get this to occur? And this is done, by the way, only a couple weeks before Michael Peterson's trial begins. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't accuse prosecutors of doing something to create a media circus that might taint the jury pool. But I'm going ahead and say that they did this to create a media circus that might taint the jury pool. And if you doubt me on that, there is a scene... In the documentary, when they are discussing this incident and whether or not this incident should come in, and David Ratliff says, I need to know if this incident's going to come in because I need to raise it with the jury in my opening statement. I can't have them surprised. And the prosecution says, and I could not believe this, says it would be malpractice for him not to raise it, whether it's going to come in or not, because it's been all over the news. And I just thought, that is, wow. If, if I were a judge and someone said that in my courtroom, boy, would I slam them because I would say, you made this a media circus. You knew exactly what would happen. It is not fair for you to then turn around and say, because it was all over the media of your doing, you now have to address it. And therefore it comes in. Talk, talk about like chicken or the egg. <laughs> David Rudolph, he's in such a difficult place because on the one hand, he wants this trial in Durham. He wants it where he can talk about the fact that Michael Peterson was a critic of this prosecution and the police. And that's something that the Durham jury will connect with. And they'll connect with Michael Peterson as a person who's a part of their community. He wants that. That's not always the case. A lot of times the defense wants to move something out of the area. But he doesn't want this. And... The one thing he could do at that point is stand up and say, well, then I want to move this trial. I don't want it here. 
And he just said why? Because he's tainted the jury pool with all of this media attention on this thing. But he can't do that. And so he's really in a difficult place. And Well, just to, to show you guys how public this was, if I'm remembering this correctly, Ratliff's body was buried in Texas. I think Baytown, Texas. And they dug up her body in Texas. And instead of getting a medical examiner to do an, an autopsy in Texas, they drive it in a hearse all the way from Texas to North Carolina. And they even have guards stand outside of the hearse when the drivers take the night off to sleep. I mean, it is just a circus. Yeah, and they try and make some chain of custody argument. That's why they're doing that. But it's totally for show. Um, in any event, they do examine her. They don't have her examined by a sort of neutral party in Texas. They have their medical examiner look at it. And not surprisingly, despite the fact that 16 years before um, her death was ruled an accident, the result of a, of a um, cerebral hemorrhage. The medical examiner in Durham looks at her and says, nope, this was a murder. It was a murder much like Kathleen's. And in fact, there are injuries on her head that are similar to those injuries in Ka on Kathleen's head. And in fact, there are seven lacerations on her head, just like on Kathleen Peterson's head. And even though... They don't charge him with murdering Ratliff and probably couldn't for all sorts of reasons. They do decide to use Ratliff's death and the similarities between Ratliff's death and that of Kathleen Peterson to prove that Michael Peterson killed his wife on a staircase. So we're going to go ahead and stop there with that, that bomb. We're going to let that bomb sort of blow off in your mind uh <laughs> overnight and brett it's it's not it's not looking good right two no. women <laughs> dead at the bottom of staircase with lacerations on their head and you are the last person to see both of them not great these are not the facts not i want to go into a murder nope. trial where i'm the defendant no no there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff stacked up against michael peterson at this point um a lot of mountains he has to overcome if he's gonna Find the promised land of freedom. <laughs> well, well, let's jump ahead really quick because there's still so much to cover before we even get to the trial and then the trial and all that happens. Do we want to give a teaser uh, about sure. the verdict? So sure. after five months of trial, that is an incredibly long trial. I, I can't. I can't physically or emotionally fathom the exhaustion that both sides are facing, uh, not to mention Michael Peterson and his family. Five months, the jury gets the case, and they deliberate for many days, and they come back. And the way a jury verdict works is it must be unanimous. So it has to be all guilty or all not guilty. If it's all not guilty, then you're acquitted. Um, if there's any split, even if it's 11 to 1, it's a hung jury, um, and there is no resolution uh, in that particular case. They come back with a unanimous verdict of guilty. And Peterson's immediately sentenced to life in prison without any possibility of parole. So we're going to leave you there for now. But don't worry. The trial may be over, but there is so much more to talk about. We're going to talk about that blowpoke some more. We're going to talk about a man named Dwayne Deaver and the work that he did on this case. We're going to talk about so many things. <laughs> I mean, we, we're going to be here a while. <laughs> so it, it, it is, but it's, but it's fascinating. This is so fascinating from a legal perspective and from a factual perspective. So we hope you'll join us uh, for the subsequent episodes. And we know we're just getting started, but if you already have thoughts, comments, questions, criticisms, hit us up. You guys know where to find us at Prosecutors Pod at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Prosecutorspodcast.com is the website, and prosecutorspod at gmail.com is our email address. Well, Alice, this has been fun. I can't wait to get back on it tomorrow and talk a little bit more about all the weirdness 
that you find in the staircase. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutor. I tried really hard not to laugh. <laughs> I tried really hard. That was a really good pun. <laughs> I love puns. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I'm glad. <laughs> we got so many five star reviews. I'm so happy. I know. Nice. Isn't it so happy? Like, I feel so validated. Uh, it's better than one star reviews. Well, I'm sure we'll get some of those. We.